Ephesians chapter number 4. We're going to read a couple of verses just after we bow for a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to add his blessing to his word this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we come this morning, we come, Lord, with thankfulness in our heart for the privilege we have again to come together to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth, to lift up our voices in praise and honor to thee through song. And I pray now as we open the precious word of God that you'll quicken your word to our hearts. You'll help me as your servant this morning to be what I need to be in these next few minutes. I pray that you'll help me to be a blessing. May every heart be open and receptive under the word of God. And I pray especially, Lord, for there may, for those that may be here today without the Lord Jesus, I pray the Spirit of God would speak to their heart this morning. And when the invitation is given, they would come and accept you as their Lord and Savior. And we'll thank you and praise you for all you do because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 4, and we're going to read this morning from verse number 22. Paul said that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want to call your attention this morning to verse 24 where Paul talks about the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning on the subject of the new man. The new man. Paul reminds us in another passage that I quote many times and quite often you hear me quoting the verse from 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 17 where Paul said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And uh, we're a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are a new man, so to speak. When we come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we're saved, Paul points out a contrast of that old man and the new man. And he talked about in verse 22 of putting off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the, de the deceitful lust. And he said, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on that new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I want to speak this morning about some things about this new man, about this new man. I believe there's a difference in a person when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel, as the old saying goes, for a profession that does not possess a new creature, that does not possess a change in a man's life. I believe, like the song you used to hear saying years ago, oh, what a difference since Jesus passed by. You'll never read of anyone in the pages of God's Word that he ever had any contact with that was ever the same after Jesus came by. When they had an experience with the Lord Jesus, they were never the same anymore. My mind goes to, I believe it's Mark chapter 5, where it talks about the old maniac of Gadara when Jesus crossed over the sea and the lake to uh, where the uh, maniac of Gadara was at and man that was possessed with demons and devils and uh, who lived among the tombs his friends were afraid of him he would take uh, stones and cut himself till the blood would run from his body but Jesus came by delivered him, set him free of that demon possession, sent him home and said, uh, go home and tell thy friends what great things the Lord hath done for thee. I believe he was a different man when he went home. He was a different man. In fact, the scripture points out that this same man who lived among the tombs, who had to be bound with chains and he would break them asunder, the Bible said the next time the people saw him, he was clothed, and uh, fully clothed and in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Jesus makes a difference. 
he makes a difference. First of all, I want to say about this new man this morning that he has a new heart. That he has a new heart. That old heart of stone that is calloused and cold is removed and a heart of flesh and a heart of warmth is replaced and put in there where that old heart of stone was at. The Lord gives a man a new heart. He gives him a heart that is cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing as it sounds, as the saying goes, how that the Lord can take a heart that is blackened by sin and wash it with red blood and it come out as white as snow. I'm grateful this morning that the Lord can give us a new heart, one that is cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 12 said, Neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Ephesians 1 and 7 said, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. The apostle Peter said, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. The Lord Jesus gives us a cleansed heart, a clean heart that has been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only gives us a cleansed heart by the blood, but he gives us a confident heart by the book. I'm grateful this morning there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And in 1 John 5 and verse 13, John said, Little children, these things that I write unto you that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I have a confident heart this morning by the book the Bible, the Word of God. This book gives me a confident heart that I do not have to live in fear because I came to the Lord Jesus one day and accepted Him as my personal Savior and was cleansed by the blood. I have a confident heart by this book that lays before me this morning called the Word of God. It is a book that gives us blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I want to tell you, I have a confident heart this morning by this book, The Word of God. Then I have a, a heart that is content by the blessings of the Lord. Do you realize this morning how much discontentment, how much unrest there is in this world this morning? I mean, of people that are searching this world over, looking for something that will bring peace and contentment to their heart. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. When you get a new heart from the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a heart that has been cleansed by the blood. It has been made confident by the book, but it is made content by the blessings of the Lord. You, all you'll ever need you find in Him. He's the only one this morning that can bring contentment and lasting peace to a troubled heart. And I want to tell you the blessings of the Lord this morning. I'm perfectly content with his blessings. I have, as the old saying goes, I have no sad stories to report. I have no sad tales to relate to you this morning about serving Jesus because I am, I am content this morning and at peace within my heart that the Lord Jesus has given me. I thank God for his blessings day by day that brings contentment to the heart. You may be here this morning in this building. You may have a heart this morning that is blackened by sin. You may have a heart this morning that is in turmoil with trouble and confusion. You may have a heart this morning that you feel uncertain, uncertainty and unrest within this morning. But I want to tell you, you can have a cleansed heart by the blood of Jesus. You can have a confident heart by the Word of God, the book, this Bible. And you can have this morning a contentment that the world knows nothing about from just receiving and living day by day from the blessings that come from the Lord. So this new man this morning has a new heart. He has a new heart. And then secondly, I want to say this morning, this new man not only has a new heart, but he has a new hunger. 
The scripture I quoted a moment ago said, The old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You not only have a new heart in Jesus this morning, but you have a new hunger. The things that you used to love you find now are suddenly unattractive. The things that used to dominate and control your life suddenly lose their glamour to you. I mean, the, 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 the strange thing about it is that the lights of this world grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. There is a new hunger. Peter described it like this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. He said, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. There is a divine the hunger and desire on the inside for the spiritual food that the Lord sets on his table. I won't tell you, I wouldn't give you a nickel for a man's salvation that didn't put a hunger for God in his heart. That there was no hunger in his heart. Why, it's just as natural for you to have a new hunger as it is for that little old baby right there to drink that bottle. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. There's a hunger on the inside of man for the things of God. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, and I believe it's verse 6, says, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And Jesus said in Matthew 4 and verse 4 that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I want to tell you there's a hunger in a man's heart that is, that is, that is a contrast from that old hunger that you hungered after the things of the world and searched and longed and looked for the things in this world to bring contentment and satisfaction to that hunger within. I want to tell you there's a new hunger there. There's a new hunger in this new man that desires the things of God. What kind of hunger do you have this morning? Do you hunger for the things of God? I want to tell you, there's, there's one or two things wrong with a person that has no hunger for God. He's either not saved, he's either not saved, or he's spiritually sick. He's spiritually sick. And you, listen, you may be at church this morning. Your name may be on the roll of Floyd Road Baptist Church. And you may be saved this morning, but I want to tell you, if you do not have a spiritual hunger for the things of God, there's something wrong with you. I believe it's Brother Herman and I a few weeks ago visited a lady one night in Cobb General Hospital. We walked in and they had, she had been through a series of tests. They could not find out what her, what her problem was and what was wrong with her. But they knew that something was wrong with her. Something was drastically wrong. And they kept her in the hospital for several days, running all kinds of tests. They run this test, couldn't find anything. They run this other test, and she told us how many different tests she'd been through. You know why they knew? I mean, they, they didn't send her home right away, but they kept searching and looking, trying to find out what was wrong with this lady. There was something wrong. They couldn't find out. You know why they didn't send her home? The first time they didn't find anything that they were looking for and just send her on home. You know, you know why the doctors were convinced there was something wrong with her? Because she'd lost her appetite. She couldn't eat. And she'd lost several pounds of weight and was just dwindling away. Now the doctors had more, they knew they couldn't find what was wrong with her at the present time that we were there. Even though they had run a series and a battery of tests on this lady, they weren't about to send her home until they got to her problem because they knew somewhere something was wrong with her because it was just not normal for a person to lose their appetite. Now, I want to tell you, just as that lady was, no, was, was in trouble and it was abnormal for her to be without an appetite to eat, it is just that abnormal for a person spiritually to keep pushing back from the table and not eating spiritually. I want to tell you, if you don't have a spiritual hunger for the things of God this morning, something's wrong with you. 
Now, I'm not your judge, nor am I a doctor, and I'm not necessarily diagnosing your case this morning, but I'm telling you, you better have a checkup if you don't have a hunger for the things of God. It's not normal. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. It is normal for a Christian, this new man, to have a new hunger for the things of God, for the food on the Lord's table, for the fellowship. Listen, do you hunger for the family of God? For fe- do you hunger for fellowship among the family of God? Do you know, I've heard people say, well, I don't need the church. I don't need them. I want to tell you, when, when I got saved and began to live for the Lord, the Lord not only put a hunger in my heart for, for the spiritual food on His table, but He put a hunger in my heart for fellowship in the family of God. Now, you may not need me this morning, but I want you to know I need you. I need the family of God. I hunger for that fellowship among the family of God. You know what Brother Kemp told me the other day? And I see it's raining. You come on anyway. <laughs> he said, Preacher, he said, I can't wait till I get back to church. I, I want to be, be at my church. And he said, I miss being out of my church. And he said, I planned on coming Sunday. And he said, the weatherman's already said, it's going to rain, it's going to be bad. And, and my condition and everything, he said, I'm praying for good weather. He said, I want to go to church so bad. Well, I see his hunger overcome the circumstances this morning. He's come on in the rain, amen. What is that? That's a hunger that God puts on the inside of that new man. There's a hunger there for spiritual food, and there's a hunger there for fellowship among the family of God, his brothers and sisters that we have in the Lord. There's a hunger there for fellowship with God's people. I'm talking about this new man this morning. Do you know this new man I'm talking about that has a new heart, that's been cleansed by the blood of Jesus, made confident by this book, and content by the blessings of the Lord? Do you know this new man this morning that has a new hunger on the inside for the food and the fellowship? Of God's people. And then thirdly this morning, I want to say there's a new help for this new man. He's given responsibility to put off these things concerning the old, the old man that is corrupt after the deceitful lust and so forth. But I want to tell you, he's not given responsibility without sufficient help. Sure, when you get saved, when you take on the name of the Lord Jesus and you become a new man in him, true, there's new responsibility. But I want to tell you, there's a new help. I've heard this over and over and over in these years of preaching and pastoring. I've heard this over and over in times of witnessing the people. Preacher, I'd love to be a Christian, and I would be a Christian if I thought I could live it. But I've seen so many hypocrites in the church and I've seen so many people that profess to know the Lord and then live another way that I don't ever want to be one of them. I don't ever want to be like them. So until I'm sure that I can live it, then I'm just not going to be a hypocrite. I'm just not going to become a Christian until I'm sure that I can live it. But I want to tell you something. God didn't give us this responsibility and leave us to ourselves. But there's a new help You see, the only difference as far as this world and our contending with this world is concerned between the saved and the unsaved is that we contend with the same. Now listen, I'm not going to stand up here this morning and paint you a picture that's not so. A lot of folks that have you to believe if you'd just come get saved that that'd solve all your problems and everything would just be peaches and cream and and just be a bed of roses from here on out. Well listen, I'm not going to be that dishonest with you. Just because you're saved don't mean you don't ever have any trouble. It don't mean you don't ever have any trials. It don't mean that you don't ever have any burdens. But I want to tell you what it does mean to be saved. It means when you walk through that valley, you've got somebody to walk with you. It means when that burden gets heavy, you've got somebody to share that load with you and to help you through those difficult times and places in your Christian life. You've got a new help. You've got a new help that helps you. I was reading about that, and and when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. And I was reading the other day about that word comforter, something I'd never realized and seen before. But I was reading and studying about that word comforter. 
And what? With that English word, comforter. When we think about comfort and to comfort someone, we think about walking up to them and putting our arm around them and patting them on the back and telling them that we sympathize with them and that, you know, and, and that we feel sorry for them and we're concerned about them and so forth and, and we try to make them feel good and tell them everything's going to be all right. But I'm told that that word comfort and comforter back yonder when that old English word was first began to be used that it meant more than just patting somebody on the back but it meant to aid them and to strengthen them. And you know what I said? We got more than somebody just walk up and put his arm around us and listen, I praise the Lord for the times that the Lord's put his arms around me and love me. But I want to tell you the comforter that I know that gives me help, he does more than just patting me on the back and saying, now everything's going to be all right. He, he does more than just kind of console me. I want to tell you he aids me and strengthens me for whatever the trial or situation may call for. He's there. He's my comforter. He, he helps me. He's, there's a new help for this new man. He helps you with your burdens, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. He helps you with life's battles. I mean, when trials and tribulations and the times of testing come, he's there to help us. He's there to help us. And I'm not going to tell you this morning, if you get saved, you won't ever have any burdens. I'm going to tell you you've got somebody that says, cast your care upon me because I care for you. I'm going to tell you this morning that we have someone who says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We have a new help in the Lord Jesus. Well, let me mention this right quickly. We have not only a new heart and a new hunger within, we have a new help to help us. And that help is going to be with us and stay with us and is going to see us all the way to a new home. I have a new home this morning, one that, that is prepared. It, it's not one that's just thrown together. Lord Jesus has been working on it now for nearly 2,000 years, and i got a feeling it's almost complete. He said, I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I preached on this Wednesday night, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Paul said, well, no, if this earth will house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we'll have a, a new building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in, heaven, in the heavens. I have a new home this morning that is just over the horizon. I'm convinced of that as much as I'm standing right here this morning, that that new home is just over the horizon. That new home is nearer than it's ever been before for God's people. It's a prepared home. And I want to tell you, it's a peaceful home. He said there's no sin there, no suffering there, no heartache there, no crying there. For all the former things are passed away. Brother Lou told me this morning, he said, Preacher, I heard this morning on the news that Iraq had met with the military leaders of the allies they had agreed to all the terms and conditions of a ceasefire this world's in trouble this morning and I thank God for that but this world's in trouble this morning there's much turmoil there's many people this morning that very seldom ever have a peaceful day but I want to tell you one of these days we're going to move into a home that is going to be as peaceful Peaceful. I mean, never a, never a care, never a trouble, never a heartache, never a woe. For all the former things are passed away. And Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. I have a new home this morning, and I like this. That new home's not only prepared, and it's not only peaceful, but it's paid for. <laughs> It's paid for. I've got a little house up in Tennessee. The Lord lets me live, and I keep making them easy installments on it every month. <laughs> It'll be mine about another eight years. It's not tore up by then. 
may not be much of it left. It may be, it may be decayed by the time I, by the time I get it paid for. I'm 45 years old, soon to be 45 years old. I was thinking about that about this this morning. I've never held a clear title to a home in this life. I've lived in several of them. I've moved around like most of you have moved around, but I'm talking about I've never had a clear title to a home that I've ever lived in, and most of you haven't either. But I want to tell you something this morning. I've got one on the other side that's prepared and peaceful. It's paid for. There's no strings on it. <laughs> the mortgage has already been paid in full. Jesus took care of that at Calvary. He paid the debt in full. And I have a clear title to a mansion on the other side. Now, I want to tell you, I don't believe it's going to be just a little room over there among many others, but I'm going to tell you, I believe that I have a mansion on the other side. It's been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. And it's mine. And I like the sound of that. Mine. My home. My home. Have you ever noticed people when they, when you go into their home, preacher, like a welcome you into our home, and they call it my home. They begin to point out all the different things about it, but it's really not their home. The bank owns more of it than they do. Most of them I've been in. Amen. And if I were to bring you into my home and and here a few months back when I was up there trying to put it back together, there's. Two or three come by, and uh, and I showed it to them. But the bank owns more of it than I do. But one of these days, when you come see me, you used to be an old song, when you come see me in my new home. <laughs> one of these days, when you see me on the other side, I want to take it on a tour through my home. My home. It's paid for. Don't have any liens on it. Don't have any mortgages on it. No strings attached to it. It's mine, free and clear. Have you ever been made a new creature in the Lord Jesus this morning? Do you have a new heart and a new hunger? Do you know that new help I was talking about a few moments ago that helps you through life's burdens and battles? Are you headed for a new home this morning? A home that Jesus said he'd gone to prepare. A place that is described as peaceful and paid for. If not, this morning I want to invite you to come. You can have every bit of this this morning that I preached about and more by just a simple act of faith. like the, In fact, the faith of a child. Just come with a simple childlike faith. Say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I can't save myself, but I believe Jesus died for me. And I here and now by faith accept the blood of God's Son as payment for my sin. And just that quick, the work will be done. And you can become a new man, a new woman, a new boy, a new girl in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, every head's bowed and every eye closed. They come get a song ready. We're going to stand and sing in a few moments. I know raising your hand this morning will not save any person here in this building. But I'm going to have a word of prayer in a moment, and I'd love to remember you in prayer. I wonder if you're here in this building this morning. Say, Preacher, in all honesty, I've never been made a new creature. I've never been made this new man that you preached about this morning. If I were to die this morning right where I sit, I have no hope of that new home you preached about. I have no hope of heaven. Please remember me in your prayers. Would you slip up a hand anywhere in this building? Just put up a hand and take it right back down and just say by that lifted hand, Preacher, I want to be remembered in prayer. I'm not saved. Anywhere in this building while I wait just a moment. I wonder if there might be a person here this morning say, Preacher, I know without a doubt that I'm saved. There was a time and place in my life I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. But when you were preaching a moment ago about that spiritual hunger, I've lost that spiritual appetite for the things of God. Things are not really well with my spiritual being. Please remember me in your prayers that I'd rededicate my life to the Lord. 
Allow the Lord to renew that hunger within my heart for the things of God. Would you slip up a hand for prayer anywhere in this building this morning? Just say, with that lifted hand, preacher, I know I've been saved, but I'm away from the Lord this morning. Remember me. Anywhere? They just slip up a hand. Anywhere? Father, thank you this morning for the precious Word of God. I thank you for this new man that we can become in the Lord Jesus. And I pray now as we stand and sing the invitation, Lord, that you'll move upon every heart and help people to be obedient to you. Help people to come this morning. May your spirit and your power give liberty to this part of the service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.